Hi, I'm Helen McAteer, Chief Executive of the Psoriasis Association, and joining me today is Professor Chris Griffiths, um, Professor of Dermatology at the University of Manchester and Honorary Consultant Dermatologist at Salford Royal NHS Foundation Trust. Today, Professor Griffiths will be answering some of the most frequently asked questions the Psoriasis Association has received regarding COVID-19, coronavirus and psoriasis. This is being recorded on Monday the 30th of March 2020, with the information given correct at this time. However, however for the most up-to-date information on COVID-19, please visit the NHS website. Professor Griffiths, um, does taking an immunosuppressant medication for psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis make you more likely to catch COVID-19? Well, I think the important thing to say is that if, like, if any patient is on what we call immunomodulatory or immunosuppressant therapy for psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, they are at higher risk of infection. And we know we've known that for a long time, which is why we advise all of our patients to have the flu vaccine uh, vaccination every every year. So they, the answer is uh, yes, they are. But there are certain levels of risk, which I guess is what we're going to talk about. Okay, so where can people find out if they're one of the 1.5 million people that are classed as extremely vulnerable? Um, and if they are classed as extremely vulnerable, what should they do? Well, they, uh, as we're speaking this morning on the um, 30th of March, Monday, 30th of March, by yesterday, the 29th of March, all of those um, highly vulnerable individuals should have received a letter um, from their uh, dermatologists or at the NHS or their GPs to, to say which group that they are um, in. And particularly those groups who are in the highly vulnerable uh, category who would have to practice what's known as shielding, which mean which we, we can come on to discuss. So, but obviously that all those letters will not have got through. Some will be a little bit ambiguous. So what we're experiencing in Manchester is that there's quite a lot of follow-up, obviously with some concerned patients wanting to have this explained to them as to which category they, they are in and why. So, should people who are taking immunosuppressant medicines be staying at home um, even if they're a key worker? Even if they're a key worker and they are uh, in the highly vulnerable group, which I guess is what you're referring to, then they, they stay at home. Perhaps we, we need to expand a little on that highly vulnerable group. So the highly vulnerable group is the group that um, has to go into what's known as shielding group heard about those individuals in the society who are aged over 70 years of age and they stay at home um, <clears throat> in isolation uh, for currently current advice is for three months. <clears throat> so they're not going outdoors, they're not making contact with other people, they're not, um, they're not interacting with uh, the outside world in the sense of interacting with, with other people. And that's the group that's been classified as in shielding. Mm -hmm. So even if you're a key, one is a key worker, it doesn't mean that you're not um, you're not uh, in, uh, in, invincible, and that no. you'll have to practice uh, shielding or um, uh, social distancing the same as anybody else. Those of us who are working in the NHS, obviously you know, in, the, in the hospital every day, we are of course practicing social distancing. But if I was on an immunosuppressant that put me into the high risk group, then I would not be here. Okay, thank you. So patients who are taking systemic or biologic drugs for their psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, um, should they still attend their regular blood test appointments? Well, that's a good question. I think that uh, certainly in Manchester, it may be varying from centre to centre. We are um, inverted commas seeing patients virtually or phoning them up most of most times to you know to ascertain how they are and whether they need any change in their treatment or they need to be seen or followed up more frequently uh, those who require blood tests and we're trying to minimize the amount of blood testing that's that uh, patients require then yes they can still come for blood testing 
it's going to vary from hospital to hospital. So I can only talk about what we're doing here at Salford, where we have probably more patients on biologics for psoriasis than pretty much anywhere else in the UK, um, is that they, we've been giving them appointments to attend the hospital, but at uh, definite times, so they're not interacting with other people other than the nurses who are taking the blood. Okay. So can having a flare-up of your psoriasis make you more likely to catch COVID-19? No, having a flare-up of psoriasis would not make um, a patient more susceptible to being infected with COVID-19. I think that's a very important point because I can imagine, and we've also already experienced this, that patients you know, hearing this news that they may be at a higher risk of infection from COVID-19 may want to stop their treatment or change the treatment or delay the dosing of a, of a biologic uh, because of that. We are advising that patients do not do that. Uh, we would only advise that uh, they would stop or delay, delay their treatment if they had developed symptoms which might be consistent with COVID-19. And obviously we are very well aware of those, but a persistent dry cough, a high temperature are two of the commonest symptoms. But that would be the same advice for any infection that a patient might get. So that's no, no real difference. If a patient believes that he or she has an infection, then again, there would be advice about delaying treatment or stopping treatment. And that's been standard practice for the last several years. Yes, and of course, it's important to remember that there are other infections still happening in the world, um, not just COVID-19. So for patients who are on biologics or systemics, they, they, they still need to follow those same principles with regards to any other infection. Yes, for sure. Uh, but, you know, uh, most uh, hospitals, most dermatology departments will have a helpline if, if there needs to be you know, advice about this. And it, and it can be confusing, I agree. But uh, our advice is that you know, patients who are you know, under the age of 70, they're on a single biologic therapy other than infliximab, which is a different category and you know, uh, with a very few patients on infliximab for psoriasis and, and even psoriatic arthritis nowadays, but they're on a single biologic therapy um, under the age of 70 and they have no significant what are called comorbid diseases such as diabetes, such as um, severe asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And there's a list of those. And that's um, practice social distancing as, as the general population is. If they are in a higher risk group, which means that they're on infliximab, they're over the age of 70, um, they have co comorbid conditions, or they're taking, um, in addition to their biologic therapy, they're on a high dose of steroid steroid pills or cyclosporin, then that, that, that's different because that increases their risk. But for most patients who are on a single biologic or um, what's called a small molecule such as a premolast or fumaderm, dimethyl fumarate, now, now it's usually used as sclerants, and they have no other risk factors and the psoriasis is under good control, then that would be fine for them to carry on but practice social distancing but they don't have to be shielded, which means they're self-isolating for three months. Okay. And, and go. I guess that most dermatologists would have been through the list of their patients and they would have identified those ones who are at highest risk. Okay, so, so we've, we've touched on it a little bit. Does the advice change depending on the type of systemic or biologic um, medicine that I'm taking yes, or patients does. are taking? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, absolutely it does. So um, there are some systemic treatments which are used for psoriasis which do not increase the risk at all because they don't, they don't um, suppress the immune system. Uh, the commonest one would be acetretin, you know, the retinoid drug. Uh, but most of the other ones that we use now do modulate or immunosuppress to some extent. And as I mentioned in the answer, maybe prematurely to the previous question, uh, there, uh, there's uh, levels of risk and the highest risk groups are those who have comorbidities 
over the age of 70 have more than their own biologic, maybe plus cyclosporine, plus a high dose of steroids, plus a higher dose of methotrexate than is the normal range. But most patients are going to be fine. There's just that group that's where they're in, they've got other risk factors. Okay. Is there anything being done to help better understand the interactions between COVID-19 and psoriasis? Well, that's a very good question. And of course, you know, when it was, you know, the news broke, I guess, you know, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, the UK probably needs to take this very seriously and there needs to be a, a plan about how we manage our patients um, on biologics and other immunomodulatory drugs. It, it was then a world, literally a worldwide discussion as to whether psoriasis patients may be more or less susceptible to COVID-19 infection. Would the biologics treatments that are on make them more or even in some cases might be less susceptible? We just don't know. And of course, this isn't just a, a UK problem. This is a, a, a global problem. Now, there will be relatively few patients with psoriasis who develop COVID-19 who we have enough information on symptoms. There'll be a lot of patients probably in retrospect, would have developed COVID-19 and had minimal symptoms, maybe just a bad cough for a day or not even had any symptoms at all. But those, are, those patients who do finish up going to hospital, having a diagnosis made or they're suspected having COVID-19, these are an important group of patients as far as understanding the interaction between the virus and psoriasis and the virus in patients with psoriasis who are on biologic therapies. So there's um, the UK have led on putting together in very short order and just took just over a week and spearheaded by Professor Catherine Smith at um, uh, Guy's Hospital, King's College London with myself and uh, Professor Jonathan Barker, uh, Dr. Satya Mahill and others um, have now launched this uh, worldwide register where we're going to capture this information from as many countries and from as many dermatologists around the world as we can. Uh, the Psoriasis Association are one of the strong supporters of this, to which we are very grateful. And this is called um, So Protect. And that's the name of the register. And I'm sure that you could probably, <coughs> that um, dermatologists would know the, um, <coughs> would know the, uh, the, the link for that. Okay, so even in these times, there's um, a lot of positive research happening um, and patients can be reassured that, um, that, that, that the researchers are looking at um, uh, everything to do with psoriasis and COVID-19 and, um, and how they can um, best be treated. Yes, for sure. So we're going to get data sort of real-time information, if you like, from the So Protect register. But at the same time, and in the UK and in Ireland, we're collecting data through our registry, which has been running for almost 13 years now, which is uh, bad beer. And, but that's sort of a, a retrospective data analysis. But real-time data, which bad beer will feed into, is going to be the So Protect register. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Professor Griffiths, for joining us today. Um, is there a final message that you would like to give to um, people with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis at this time? Well, thank you, Helen, for um, organising this interview. I think these are important questions that we've discussed. And I guess that my, my advice to, to patients is that uh, they shouldn't worry unduly. I think there has been considerable thought gone into how we manage um, people in these, uh, not just with psoriasis, but with psoriasis <clears throat> and on these biologic therapies and other immunosuppressants. And I think if we all practice the guidance that's been um, uh, decided by the um, National Health Service, uh, the Chief uh, Medical Officer's um, Office, and also the Royal College of Physicians, working with the British Association of Dermatologists, I think that we'll be able to manage our patients highly effectively and, and also safely. Thank you very much.